Hi, my name is Cecilia Puna, and welcome to this episode of Brave New Women. All around the world, there are amazing, ordinary women doing extraordinary things. Brave New Women is about giving those women a platform and a voice, and it's about changing the way that women are perceived. And it's a way of inspiring all of us to do the things that we've always wanted to do. Today, I'm really thrilled to be talking to Ali Mapletoft. Ali started her career as a music video director and animator, and she worked in that for nine years. And then she set herself up as an independent print designer with the brand name Age of Reason Studios. She specializes in luxury home interior goods and fashion accessories and is known for her playful and irreverent prints that champion women. Ali is also a creatrix coach. And she works with creative women so that thrive in business. And we're going to be looking and diving more deeply into um, what is a creatrix coach and what her role is in in that. So welcome, Ali. Thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Ali, I'd like to start by going right back to the beginning. So I think you had a fairly unusual childhood. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, I mean, as with anybody's childhood, it was very usual to me and um, nothing about it seemed extraordinary at the time. But now that I'm older and I've met more people, um, I can see that it is extraordinary and I'm very grateful for the experiences that I have. So I grew up in the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, which is a small country in Southern Africa that is entirely landlocked by South Africa, but is nevertheless an independent country and has never been ruled by South Africa. It's a very beautiful place, so it's very mountainous. And on the eastern side of the country, the the border is really defined by a a sharp escarpment and a, a range of mountains. Um, called the Maluti Mountains, or the Drakensberg Mountains, the Dragon's Breath Mountains. And that is something that has really defined, I think, in me a a need and a sense that space and um, landscape and natural beauty is really, really important. Um, when we were kids, we had this awareness that um, Tolkien was actually born not far from where we lived um, over the border in South Africa. And that's why we always called um, the mountains, you know, the, the, the Dragon's Breath Mountains. Um, Drakensberg it alludes to dragon in, in Afrikaans as well. And we grew up um on a pottery really in a pottery my my parents ran um quite a large pottery for the time they had one of the biggest kilns i think in the in that part of the world and they made beautiful stoneware pottery that they were trained to create in scotland um by a guy called joe finch and they ran that pottery for my entire childhood and beyond um, beyond when I, I actually came to the UK to study. And we had a very free and um, carefree childhood in many ways. We, there was a lot of space. There was a lot of land. We got to get our hands dirty and play with clay and create. And for many years when I was young, we didn't have a TV or even a telephone for a very long time. Um, our electricity came from a generator and we would have blackouts. And then my Dad would go stumbling and swearing in the dark up to the generator at the top of the garden, <laughs> to pull the the cord to get it started like a lawnmower. And um, we had five big dogs, big Great Dane dogs and a Pyrenees mountain dog. And we spent a lot of time outside and a lot of time um, building tree houses and playing in the dirt and making things out of clay. And um, yeah, it was idyllic in in many many ways. Were you living in a in a town or in a in the country or we village? were in a village. So I grew up in a village called Kolonyama, which means plenty meat. And it um presumably alludes to the the 
the animals that would have been there at the time. So either either livestock or or uh, wild beasts that, that you could hunt, I suppose. Um, there's a mountain at Kolonyama, and if you climb the mountain, you'll find um, sand paintings from the original sand people who who lived in those caves um, up until you know hundreds, not not thousands, but up until hundreds of years ago. Um, when they were driven out by other tribes. So, yeah, it's a it's an incredible place. It's a magical place. And there is art everywhere. So we have the cave paintings and rock paintings, which are very prevalent. You'll find them all over the place in Lesotho. Um, we have crafts. We have a lot of pots being made. We have a lot of basket weaving and tapestry weaving and the houses themselves are a work of art. So you'll see these um, red ochre mud covered houses with thatched roofs. These houses are actually constructed from a mixture of um, wood and cow dung. So a wooden frame with cow dung and then um, a wooden um, frame for the roof with thatch. And typically it's the women who do the the decoration and the mud um, covering on the outside of the houses and they all have these um, cow dung floors which is much cleaner and less smelly and much more um, ecologically friendly and sensible than than people might think. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you find it coming to to the, to the UK to live in the UK? It was a culture shock. It was a culture shock and you know, I, not in the sense that I hadn't seen, um, you know, cities and towns and, and whatnot. Of course I have. Um, it's a myth that all of Africa is 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 mud huts and and whatnot. Um, you know, the, the cities close by to where I lived, the Maseru, where I went to school and where we moved to when I was older, you know, has international five-star hotels and embassies and swimming pools and modern buildings and you know all of these things but the culture shock really was when I came to the UK at the age of 16 just more around a mindset and a way of being I think I do remember that moment actually getting out of the plane in Heathrow and looking around me and being like wow I feel like I'm in a movie you know I've never seen so many people because even in the center of Johannesburg or, or Cape Town, you know, when we traveled when I was growing up, there weren't quite as many people as that. And certainly not as many white people. I do remember, you know, I'm a white person myself, but I do remember being in Heathrow Airport and going, wow, I don't think I've ever seen quite so many white people in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And tell me about the mindset. I think we grew up with a very different, slower pace, a slower way of being, perhaps. And um, I think the the way that people operate, um, or at least when I was a child in Lesotho, was just a calmer pace. You know, there wasn't an urgency so much for everything to get done and everything to be kind of now <laughs> and I think that was an interesting shift I think there's also very different um cultural things around very simple things like um how much physical bodily space is appropriate around you and and that's changed you know we know that that's changed in the past couple of years everywhere in the world but I do remember finding it really interesting here, for example, if people are on a bus, they'll sit as far away from each other as possible. Whereas where I grew up, people will sit close to each other so that they can talk, <laughs> you know, exchange stories or, or, or chat to somebody. Whereas here, people will avoid eye contact and sit as far away as possible. And if you make eye contact with somebody or say hi to them, especially in central London or central Newcastle, the assumption is that there's some kind of agenda. <laughs> Whereas I didn't grow up with that, you know. 
And so I, yeah, I I found myself in strange situations as a 16 year old girl, you know, saying hi to somebody or making eye contact and them either assuming that I was asking for something or or worse, offering something. Um, (laughs) And that got me into some strange scenarios. It's, I mean, it's a bit it, when you say it like that. It's actually very sad, the way that we live in in well in, in in the West that we're not able to be sitting next to people on the bus and exchange stories and look at people. It, it, it's really saying something about how divided we are as as people. Yeah, there's you know it's very subtle. There's a different way of approaching even looking at somebody, and it's so interesting. You wouldn't think that we look at people differently in different cultures, but we do look at people differently, even in the the, the physical realm. So, if I'm having a conversation with you, and um, I'm staring straight into your eyes, like here, that's that's how we usually do things in a conversation. Where I grew up, if I'm staring straight into somebody's eyes, particularly if I feel that they are senior to me or older than me or anything like that, that's a little bit confrontational and disrespectful. So it's my kind of duty almost to to, to be deferential and kind of look away. However, if something's happening in the street or there's a spectacle going on, it's perfectly okay to stare. So it's just a it's a subtle thing it's like different different ways that we look at people and different etiquettes around what's okay and what's not okay and I think what I noticed straight away here in the UK is that there isn't very much communal expression of emotion so where I grew up in Lesotho when people grieve they grieve physically and vocally in public um when people celebrate in South Africa and in Lesotho and countries around that region they they celebrate vocally and physically in public so I've seen people dance and sing and just express so much joy with their voices and their bodies just because it's raining you know this is a dry, dry arid land so we've had droughts where you know it starts to rain and people would just be outside take their shoes off usually put their shoes in a plastic bag and put them on their head to keep them dry and just walk in the rain and let the water run over their toes and dance and shout and sing. And we just don't really do that here. You know, when when somebody's football team wins over there or, or, or something exciting is going on, people gather, people gather in circles and groups and they dance and there's no embarrassment about it. They just dance. You know, and here it's very different. Things like that are reserved for in a nightclub when you've had a few drinks or in the privacy of your own home with the curtains shut. It's a very different um, way of using your body and voice and expressing those things. It sounds as though um, we have an awful lot to learn from those ways of being because I think that... um, for many of us in the Western world, our, our emotions are sh- so shut off mm-hmm. and um, we're so unaware of what, what we're even feeling, let alone expressing them um, and let alone expressing them publicly. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's always um, there's always a danger that we can over-romanticise other people's cultures and at the same time, I think we are quite repressed and it does creep into a lot of the way that we do things, including self-expression in the arts, including asking for what we really want in our lives, businesses, families, relationships. Mm. Um, it creeps in this idea that, you know, you've got to keep it all held in and bottled up. I can remember, um, I think it was the first or second week that I was in this country. I was told by a man who I didn't even know that I was standing like I, I, I was pregnant. I looked like I was pregnant. Those were his words. I, I didn't even know him. So, you know, I don't know where he thought that commenting on my body or my posture was, was available to him, but, but he did. And I can just remember this thing of like thinking like, oh, I didn't know that I was supposed to zip everything up, you know. And there's a zipping up of everything that sort of happened to me in my teens being here 
And that's part of the transition and the threshold between childhood and adulthood and the expectations of what it means to be a woman and what's allowed and what's not allowed. And it's also cultural. Um, I, I, you know, I never, when I was a schoolgirl growing up, felt that we needed to be quite as zipped in, both physically, energetically and emotionally, as girls do here in this culture. Mm. Mm. Is that, um, I'd just like to sort of um, take a turn. Is that, I mean, you're a creatrix coach, so I'd like to ask you, first of all, what that is, and then also ask you if that's the sort of work that you're doing with your clients. Okay, so a creatrix coach is somebody who supports and guides anybody who self-defines as a creatrix. And in, in Latin, creatrix means she who creates, she who makes. Um, I'm using that term from a place of feminine energy and the divine feminine. So I see myself as both a business coach and an alchemist of the divine fem feminine and the divine creative. And so if somebody is expressing from a place of divine creativity, divine femininity, then as far as I'm concerned, they are a creatrix, whatever their gender identity is. That's, that's how I would see it first and foremost. And what I do is I really um, help the creatrix to let go of the things that hold her back so that she can really step into the truest expression that's available to her here in this realm, in this three-dimensional world. And a lot of that work involves a balance between things like releasing the old stories, releasing the energetic block, whether that be from the mind or from the spirit, it usually happens with the body. So in order to release our money blocks, for example, we may need to learn to use our body in a different way by tapping, by shouting, by allowing ourselves to move in flow. So I'm very much about the balance between that side and then What's your marketing strategy for the next quarter of the year? Because I really believe that they go hand in hand and one without the other um, just doesn't have quite as much richness. So we could dive straight into somebody's business strategy or marketing strategy for their paintings or their design or their fashion or whatever it is that, that they create in this world. We can dive straight into that and without working on the mindset and the energy, without releasing some of the old stories that hold that person back, we won't make as much progress that feels aligned to who they really are. And that's so important. So if you're working with somebody, you've got a new client, what would be the trajectory of the, your work with them? Okay, so that would really be about um, working on, first and foremost, what are the stories that hold me back? What support do I need to move through those? What boundaries do I need to put into place to uphold that? And how do I commit to holding the vision and there are exercises and things that we can do in all of those areas, acknowledgement of our stories, putting it in place boundaries, asking for support and holding the vision. There are specific exercises that we can do. And largely it's down to intention and it's down to committing to these practices on a daily basis. And what that means is noticing how you're feeling today right now, today, and not ignoring it and not burying it and pushing it down. Because when we push down feelings and emotions, even if they're feelings and emotions about our cash flow forecast or our marketing plan, when we push feelings down, it's like a beach ball. The more you push it down under the water, the more violently it's going to jump back up and smack you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So there's a there's an emotional side of the work that you do. There's a creative side, and then there's the the marketing side or the the business, the money side. Yeah. And I would say that really I deal in the areas of mindset, messaging and magic and woven through the magic piece is your marketing magic and your money magic and your visioning magic. And it's all interconnected. And so I am not your dry business coach who's just going to be like, okay, show me your, I don't know, KPIs and your cash flow first like, let's talk about where you're at. Let's talk about what you're carrying around on your back already. Because every single creatrix who's ever come to me for support with her business is carrying a heavy backpack full of stories and shadows. And the basis of many of these things is what I call the creatrix wound. And that is the story that says, you're not worthy this isn't real work. Art is not a proper job. You ought to get a real job. You can't be a writer. You can't be a painter. You can't be a performer. You're not allowed to be a fashion designer. You need to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, work in the financial services or something like that. And the creatrix is carrying that around with her to some degree, whether or not she's living into her vision She's carrying some of that story around with her and there are layers and layers and layers. And what we do is we release parts of that story through in-depth work together, both physically, well, physically and energetically. And a lot of it is mindset work. You know, I would say that the biggest thing that has taken me from being somebody who's very scared very worried, very broke, very adrift to somebody who feels um, grounded, at peace, and growing my personal wealth. The biggest thing has been mindset. So it hasn't been the strategy, although the strategy works alongside the mindset. It really has been the mindset of opening myself up to receiving whatever is available to be received. So tell me more about that. What, what is the process of opening up? What, what does that entail? How do, you, how do you get your clients to open up to be able to receive? I think it, first and foremost, it's about noticing how you receive anything at all. So I think the first thing is noticing how you receive one thing is likely to be how you receive another thing. So how you receive a compliment very often mirrors your capacity to receive other things in your business like money. So when somebody pays us a compliment and they say, oh, you look great today. I love the color of your hair. And you say, oh, I do it myself. That's why it's so patchy. That is a pushing away of something that is available for us to receive. And it can be about starting with something as simple as saying, thank you. When somebody offers us support and help, I'll pick up your kids from school today so that you can have an extra hour's work. And we say, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, I'll do it, don't worry. Because we fear the judgment of being that needy person. We've just pushed away something that was available for us to receive. Hmm. And somebody says, I'll make you a cup of tea. What what, what are you having? And we say, oh, no, 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 don't worry, it's fine, or or, I'll, I'll make it. Again, we've pushed away something that's available for us to receive. And so the very first step is so simple and we get to work on this and, and, and take it to, to the next level. But the, the very first step is acknowledgement and, and noticing what it is that we are doing with things that are coming to us. And things that are coming to us are all energy. 
So a compliment that's coming to us is a type of energy. Some help that's coming to us is a type of energy. Some support that's coming to us is a type of energy. Some money that's coming to us is a type of energy. And if we're blocking it in one area, we are almost guaranteed to be blocking it in another area. And so the the simple act of accepting and receiving with grace whatever is given to us and really feeling the gratitude for that opens us up to things like receiving money. Mm. So I I still need to catch myself doing this. I I can block money even now with the awareness that I have around it. It is still possible for me to block money. So somebody owed me a small amount of money recently and she sent me a WhatsApp message saying give me your bank details I'll I'll transfer you this money and because it was a small amount of money and because I had made the assumption that I had more money than her which is an arrogant assumption I don't really know that for a fact I didn't send her the account details there was a block there and I actually had to catch myself because this was for something that she really wanted to contribute to. It was a personal thing, not a business thing, but it was something that was happening that she really wanted to make a contribution towards. And I was blocking her. And so I really needed to check in with myself and go, why am I blocking her from making a contribution to something that's important to her because of my money story that I'm not allowed to receive from somebody who I perceive to have less than myself, even though it was already agreed, even though she has a desire to make this contribution for herself. And so it's just catching those little moments. And even with that awareness, it took me a few days to send her those account details. Mm -hmm. And so the the invitation for myself is to notice and go, oh, that's interesting that you did that. Where else are you doing that? Are you doing it in the business? So the, the, the simplest things are always the, the doorway to these bigger things. It's interesting that you talk about how uh, creatives or creatrix um, have issues with money. And it's almost though they're coming from a position of because we're creative, we're not allowed to both enjoy our work and be fully expressed in our creativity and have money. And I think that um, women generally have issues around money, probably men do too, but I think women have issues. What I see is women having issues around accepting I'm, it's okay not to pay me very much because actually I'm not worth very much. And so I, I said to a client on Friday, she said, I'm, I'm not being paid very much, um, but it doesn't really matter because I'm going to change jobs anyway. And I said, well, I actually think it does matter because it's changing your vision of your vision of your worth. So, um, absolutely. And I think for a long time, um, women's work in, in the kind of, uh, patriarchal, um, sort of uh, post-agricultural world that we live in, even even with the advent of, of agriculture, I think that women's work became um, the work that was done in the background, you know, that wasn't paid. It's almost like we have this very long-standing blueprint of toiling and striving to, to provide and nurture without expectation of being paid. And I think that 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 shadow sits very heavy on our spirit. And I think that, of course, there are other ways to feel rewarded other than money. And the thing is that creatrixes who are doing a lot of work for very little money, very often are not feeling rewarded. They're feeling sad and resentful and stressed out because of lack of funds. And I think the contraction sometimes comes where industries almost encourage, well, they do encourage this idea that if you enjoyed the work, if you did it and you you were just, you know, stepping into your soul's purpose and, and loving doing that work, then why do you need to be paid for it? 
And we see that again and again with, you know, writing competitions, poetry competitions, painting competitions, you know, companies offering um, the opportunity to be seen just for exposure, you know, in, in exchange for thousands of hours of work. Because if, if hundreds of people apply for these things, then obviously thousands of hours of work have gone into this. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for that. But what I am saying is that we get to question how much we give in exchange for low or, or no pay. And I think very often, if we really look at it, we are buying into the story that because I enjoy this work, because I love doing it, I don't need to be paid for it. And the invitation is always to go, well, what would it feel like to love this work, enjoy this work, lean into this work fully and accept payment with grace as well? What would that feel like? Mm. And so what work do you do with your clients around um, making that happen, making sure that they are actually being paid? I think the very first thing that we need to do, and it sounds counterintuitive, the very first thing that we need to do is uncouple our self-worth from the amount of money that we receive. And that's not necessarily a quick or easy process or a quick or easy fix. So if I have a painting, for example, that I want to sell and I've decided that it feels right that this painting is $3,000, for example. The first thing we really need to do is to tune into what would it feel like for somebody to say yes and buy that painting. And really, I, you know, I encourage people to really meditate on that. What would it feel like when somebody says yes? and says, here's my $3,000. I, I can't wait to have that painting in my living room. It's going to elevate my space. So we, we meditate on that and feel into that. The next thing, counterintuitively, that we really need to do is to tune into what's it going to feel like if somebody says no? How will I feel? What will that contraction feel like in my body? Will I feel sick? Will I feel guilty? Will I feel greedy? Will I feel a lump in my throat? Will I feel ashamed, ashamed of making an offer that somebody has rejected. And it's by sitting with what would that feel like and allowing ourselves to kind of get used to it rather than, like I said, with the beach ball, pushing it down. Because if we push it down, when it happens, it's going to smack us in the face really hard because it's really going to hurt. And I think it's about really tuning into how will I feel when somebody says yes? How will I feel when somebody says no? And then practicing that, practicing tuning into those feelings. And what we get to do is we get to attain a balance because not everybody is going to say yes to your $3,000 painting. And not everybody is going to say no either. And we only need a small minority of the people who we make the offer to, to say yes, to sell that. A minority of one, in fact. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what that gets to mean is that whether somebody says yes or no, is it, it's almost incidental. Of course, we, we love it when somebody says yes, and we don't need everyone to say yes. And so when somebody says no, it's not quite as painful. So rather than not making the offer at all out of fear of somebody saying no, we get to really lean into what are the emotions that come up when somebody says no? And somebody will say no for real very soon, and that's okay. And when they do, and you're feeling that contraction in your body, and you're feeling like you're greedy and you're guilty, and it's putting a lump in your throat and making you feel ashamed for even making that offer in the first place, then the opportunity is to actually release that energy through your body. And I would do something like, you know, at the simplest level where I live, I run down to the sea, scream at the sea and throw rocks in it at the very simplest, most basic level. Mm. And then at the most advanced level, I might work with somebody to do something like 
quantum flow or vocal release to actually move that energy through their body. And we also look at the practical side of pricing. Have you accounted for all of the years of experience that it's taken you to get to this point right now? Because very often artists will go, well, it cost me this much in materials and this is how many hours I spent on it. And so this is the price of the painting. It's $300. And it's like, well, no, it's not $300 because it's taken you all your life to become the creatrix that you are right now. And so on the practical side, we would look at that as well. And what I really encourage creatrix to do is to stop looking at the competition's pricing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and you also get them to feel into what would it feel like if they put 5,000 yeah, or, or 7,000 or 10,000. Absolutely. You know, there isn't a right price for a piece of art. And one of the most magic things about this is that we are to a great extent able to call in what we believe we're able to call in. And if we have a contraction around calling in money that is so strong that it, it blocks us, that's what we need to work on. Not bringing our prices down, not necessarily even changing our audience or finding the right people although that is part of the marketing piece and important but first and foremost we need to believe that we're able to receive that money and feel worthy and we also need to understand that when we do receive three thousand dollars thirty thousand dollars thirty million dollars we are still the same person it doesn't mean anything special about us. It doesn't make us better or more worthy or even happier. The invitation is to find the number that settles into your body. I almost feel like a number can just drop in and like drop into your chest and you can be like, that's the number that I want to receive for this. And for an artist, this is actually a more aligned way to find a price than adding up how much your materials and your hours cost you. Mm. Mm. And how, if you're finding a price for some of your work, how long does it take you for the number to drop into your head? I always say the number doesn't drop into my head. It drops into my body. It's like drops into my belly. Mm. <laughs> I think I've got much quicker at this. And part of that is about owning my decisions. When I first started, I would second guess something like this for days and weeks and months. You know, I could go around in circles for ages trying to find the price for a scarf or a cushion or a print or a painting. And I think I've become more adept at two things. First of all, knowing from the business perspective, um, what's the minimum transaction that, that I want to bring in that's actually worth running this business for with all its costs and all of its marketing? So there's an awareness of that practical kind of more masculine side of it. And then there's also an awareness of the more, what I call the divine feminine side of it, which is um, what would feel really great to receive? Like what would I be excited about receiving for that piece of work? And then I'll kind of do a little bit of, alchemy and balance those two things out and I would say I'm making my pricing decisions more from the latter more from the divine feminine than the kind of alpha masculine place now um, because I've learned to trust that it's okay to do that and of course we need to know the binary practical things like how much does my business cost to run on a daily weekly monthly quarterly yearly basis we need to know that and we also get to allow the number that would feel really great to receive to drop in. I think very often when we begin to do this at the start, we're so blocked about receiving that we don't even dare to let ourselves think about the higher number. And so we go, oh, well, my intuition is telling me that that's the highest number that I, I can receive. And it's like, is it your intuition though? Or is it fear? 
shouting louder than intuition. Um, I have a process which I call now um, that I work with people to 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 use um, for working through things like this. And it's it's a mindset piece of work, really. I call it now. It's an acronym for notice it, own it and work on it. And work on it can mean work through it. So noticing is the acknowledgement. Owning it is really sitting with the feeling and go, oh, why is this making me feel this way? What is this? What is this about? Where did I get this? So sometimes it can be something as simple as, you know, I'm really afraid to charge this much for my painting because I once made some paintings to sell at the school fair when I was nine. And my dad told me it was ridiculous to, to charge you know, five, five pounds or five dollars for them. And so I'm still sitting with that shadow in my heart. Mm. And it's about really owning that and going, yep, that is a part of me. I allow that to come to the table. Um, I use archetypes a lot in that ownership piece. So the archetypes that I love to, to use are the shadow archetypes. So the child, the victim, the saboteur and the prostitute. These are Jungian archetypes, which are also used by Caroline Miss. And I really love to bring those archetypes in and go, can we welcome her to the table and allow her to sit with us rather than saying, oh no, victim, child, go away. Can we take ownership of that and actually welcome that abandoned child or welcome that victim to the table and say, right, okay, sit down, let's, uh, let's see what you've got. And in that way, we're able to work through it in a way that is not burying and pushing down um, our story, our history, our emotions, our energy. Who, where have you, what have you been your main influences in your work? I read a lot. So I'm reading every day. And that really started with a piece of beautiful synchronicity. The universe kind of dropped this into my lap about three and a half years ago, I saw, I think it was a Gumtree ad and somebody said, I'm, I'm getting rid of this suitcase full of books and it needs to be gone today because I'm moving. And I was curious and I asked, you know, what kind of books are these? And this lady said, oh, well, they're mostly um, business and self-help books. And at the time I was right at the beginning of my journey of coaching people and I had this really like visceral feeling in my body, like we have to get those books. And I said to my husband, we have to get those books. It's really important. <laughs> he was like, oh, babe, we, what? We've been clearing out. We've been getting rid of stuff. We've been going to the charity shop to get rid of stuff every couple of days. Why do you want to bring a suitcase full of books? And I was like, I don't know. I just need you to go I've got a call with somebody, but I need you to go right now in the car and collect this suitcase full of books. It was like a visceral need. It was like, we need those books. <laughs> <laughs> and so he went and got the books and they came from um, a lady called Nicola Cairncross, who wrote a, a book called The Money Gym. And in amongst the books, she had left some of her personal notes about her self-development and there they were as a bookmark in one of the books and it just went through this beautiful journey of of how she got to know her value and I actually contacted her and said there's a, there's some notes in here that look really important and she was just like oh, whatever it doesn't matter I mean I don't need any of that but thank you for taking the books and later on, she became my money mentor for about six months and helped a load of money stories and money blocks. I then went on to be coached by somebody else who somehow was connected to that world. I'm not really even sure how, maybe Facebook, maybe something else. I was coached by a lady called Ebony Allard for six months again. And that was also life-changing. And I just continued reading. And more recently, 18 months ago, I took on another coach and I have continued to really allow myself, though I am a coach, to be coached because I think it shows the 
the highest commitment to this type of work to not only be giving these gifts to the world, but also receiving them. And so built into my business cost as a basic bottom line level cost is the coaching that I receive from other coaches. And I'm, I feel like I'm always learning. And that's something that I think I've got my dad to thank for. He is always, always learning. He's never going to be done. He's always learning something new about his craft, about his art, about ways of thinking. I love that story about the suitcase. I mean, that's that's extraordinary. Yeah, we still have all the books on the bookshelf. You know, there were a few that that fell apart and a couple that, you know, we found duplicates of and they went to the charity shop. But the bookshelf is absolutely full. You know, there were enough self-help and business books and, you know, um, books about things like your relationship with money, like Rich Dad, Poor Dad and um, books like um, Denise Duffield Thomas's book, um, um, is it Get Rich, Lucky Bitch? And, you know, all, all of these things were, were in that suitcase. And I just began to read through them. Um, there was one called The Richest Man in Babylon, which is um, kind of apocryphal fables that are written in the style of biblical stories about money. And, you know, there's just so much richness in this suitcase that, you know, for, for what I felt like years, I was just working through all of these books. And I love the the idea that it was actually in a suitcase. I mean, I'm getting an image of a like a battered old sort of Paddington Bear brown yeah. suitcase. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. <laughs> you never put books in a suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't even lift it because the handle will break yeah. off. So. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any particular success stories from your clients? Oh, so many, so many, you know, it's hard to even know where to begin because every week there's something comes up that just, you know, moves my soul. I have um, a couple of clients who have begun to incorporate into their art practice um, forms of um, healing and helping other people, which I absolutely love. And one of them that springs to mind who always springs to mind because she's still on her journey and she's so um, she's growing so much is my client Amanda Thompson Amanda started out working with me it must be about two years ago now and she's local to me in Brighton and Hove in East Sussex in the UK and she was working as a cleaner doing you know weekly um, domestic cleans for people and she just knew that that she had an artist living in her spirit. She just knew it. And she'd been drawing in sketchbooks and collecting sketchbooks for a number of years. They're all kind of like on bookshelves and under the bed. But she had this, just this knowing that there was something bigger for her. And she's spoken about this very openly in public. So I feel it feels very aligned to talk about it here with you. At the time when she started working with me and she was um, working as a cleaner, she was really struggling with alcohol in a way that was having a very, very detrimental effect on her health and her quality of life and her relationships and her sense of worthiness and self-love. And what what I've seen over the two years that we have been working together is somebody who has just blossomed and transformation has happened. So Amanda is now, I think it was today that she said she was, was it 666 days sober? I can't remember exactly what the number was, but she is sober. And she is selling her art. She creates um, notebooks and journals out of these beautiful prints that she creates that were all in these sketchbooks under the bed. She has also um, started a group which is rapidly becoming an organization called the Sober Artists Club that supports um, people to move through their um, addiction to substances through using art as a form of healing and so she's out there in the world helping other people to rise and move through something that was 
very painful for her. And it's, it's magical to see. And when I say it's magical, I'm not exaggerating. It is like I am witnessing magic. That's the power of this work, the power of, of transformation that people can go through. And, you know, not everyone will start out, um, you know, unhappy cleaning toilets and, and and using substances. We all have a different starting point and we all have different privileges and different lived experiences. But what this story really shows me is that no matter where you're at, if there's a spark inside you that is really linked to creative source and you can access that and you can allow yourself to be supported and helped to access that you can do anything mm. Mm. and that's uh, that's just the most lovely story and i i also love the way that um well first of all that things are being transmitted from other women through you to other women and that, that it's it, there's a there's a transmission going on and also that um where what people are able to give in the world is often what they've had to suffer that where they where they've had to learn the things that have been difficult for them end up being the ways that they can actually they can actually give back absolutely and you know that's definitely been that's definitely been the case for me um you know starting a creative business when i i didn't really know what i was doing at all um, and then seeing Age of Reason go through all the gears, you know, from being this idea, I had three or four scarf designs, to being stocked in, you know, a few little boutiques around the country, to actually growing a mailing list of of um, buyers and people who who wanted to be part of my world and taking it all the way to things like the Vogue gift list and Selfridges London department store and Gallery Lafayette Beijing and Liberty London and all of these places where my product has, has shown up. Um, that has been a journey of self-development and transformation as much as it's been a journey of um, marketing and business strategy and positioning and, and all of that stuff that we normally associate with business. And when I see this mirrored in my clients, I find it so exciting. And my my hope really is to enable them to feel more supported than I did when I was on that journey. Because I, I really stagnated and, and, and stayed still for about seven or eight years. I wasn't really evolving and moving forwards for a really, really long time. And I was in an unhappy place. And I felt it deeply in my body during that time. I was very, very often sick. I suffered from all kinds of things, you know, from digestive problems to, you know, reproductive issues and like all kinds of stuff was being held in my body. And it was through that journey of self-discovery and transformation and realizing like this light bulb, like, ah, oh, all of how I'm being in my business is is linked to my energy and how I'm being as a person that has set me free from that. And I'm still a work in progress. None of us are ever going to be done. Nobody's, you know, even the Dalai Lama, I'm sure has work to do on, on themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the beautiful thing about it. It gets to be this ongoing evolution. And I find that so beautiful. And I, I, I see this mirrored in my clients. I have another client, um, Caro Gomez, who's an incredible fashion designer. Um, she is um, an indigenous woman who's bringing her indigenous wisdom into the world. And what I see there is this almost like doorway being opened where a couple of years ago when we started working together, she saw herself as, you know, just some fashion designer from El Salvador that nobody really gets doing her best in London to do her thing. And she's so much more than that. She's so much more than that. She is somebody who connects people back to essence through the wisdom that she has acquired from her her roots. And I find it so beautiful to see that when the penny drops for people, what they then realize is it doesn't really matter if I'm creating fashion or paintings or 
ceremonies or ritual or healing programs, it's all channeled from source. I'm allowed to be multi-passionate. I'm allowed to have all of it and be all of it and really live into that vision in a way that's fun, mm. you know, because we forget mm. that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to be talking to a group of women lawyers on Thursday. And that's one of the things I want to say to them that, um, you know, it's not that serious. <laughs> it doesn't matter that much. It never matters that much. <laughs> it gets to be fun. Yeah. Ali, I could talk to you all afternoon. Um, there are two There are two questions I usually ask, and I'm actually going to ask you both of them at the same time, because I feel as though the whole interview has in fact been about these two questions. So um, you may have something to say, you may not. Um, the first question I have is, um, being being a woman for you in your career, has that been positive or negative or neutral? And the second question is, is there anything that we've missed that you'd like to say, or is there a particular message that you'd like to give to the people who are listening? Anything at all that you'd like to add? I think when it comes to being a woman and doing this work and being in business and just being in life, I consciously choose to see it as a gift. And it does come with challenges. And the level of challenge that it comes with will depend on your lived experiences and your privileges. I'm somebody who's had incredible lived experiences and I'm somebody who has a lot of privileges. And for those things, I am eternally grateful. And it's my hope that I can use that to support other people who maybe don't have the experiences or the privileges that I've had. And I think that I wouldn't call it neutral. It just is. But I wouldn't necessarily call it positive or negative either. I think we're, we're compelled, aren't we, to categorize and label things into positive and, and negative. And I think being a woman, the best that I can do is embrace that and do my very best to lift up other women. And when I say other women, I, I include other self-identifying women. And if we can all do that, if we can all do our very best to live into our vision in its highest, and that might be a very small thing or it might be a very big thing, there's no right size for your vision. It's all very personal. If we can do our very best to do that and at the same time give other people a leg up, a little bit like turning back down the, the hill when we're hiking and, and, and pulling somebody else up, if we can do that, then I think we're doing a really good job. And I think being a woman is awesome. Mm. <laughs> I've forgotten the other question now. <laughs> so the other question was if there's anything that we've missed, anything, a message you've got from listeners, anything, anything additional that you'd like to say? I think what I would love to say is that a journey as a creatrix, a journey into having a successful business or even just a happy life is about sovereignty, which is about really knowing and trusting yourself and really allowing yourself to be open to be to be the person who receives the things that you really want to receive. So if you really want to receive love, that's okay. If you really want to receive wealth, that's okay. If you really want to receive help and support, that's okay. Be really, really honest with yourself about what you desire to receive and be honest with yourself about what your standards are. And in that way, you get to stand in sovereignty and stop apologizing and stop asking for permission to live into your fullest self. Thank you. And that's, that's just a very, very powerful message. 
Um, I love the work that you're doing. I love the work that you're doing in making people who are creative and who are so important in this world actually be able to be happier and to be able to live and to have make decent decent livings out of that and to be recognised in terms of wealth for what they're what they're contributing. Um, so I just like to acknowledge the work that you're doing. I think it's very very important, and it's um, it's just been a joy to speak to you. So thank you. Thank you so much. I I've really really enjoyed this conversation, and you know, echoing what you said um, before, I could talk to you all afternoon about this. <laughs> well, we'll have to find an afternoon where we can, we're somewhere between France and England, where we can do that. Absolutely. And I'm going to say this for accountability. I am finishing my book at the moment, The Prosperous Creatrix book. And so when that's complete, I would absolutely love to have another chat with you about it. Sure. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Brave New Women. Certain podcast sites such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts or Podchaser let you leave a rating and a review. The more ratings and reviews we get, the more people will listen and the more these women's stories will be shared. So I'd really appreciate it if you could. Thanks for listening.